I would like to welcome our uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Hale, Principal Engineer from Southern Company. Thank you. Good afternoon. I wanted to start by saying there's been a lot of good information shared. Uh, I'm sure you all agree with how well it's gone, and uh, we're at that point, though. The speakers did not get together and share the information that was going to be uh, shared by each of them. So based into my presentation is some redundancy, and I'll try to avoid that. But I think also it's a, they support each other real well. So there are some redundancy in my discussion in Joe's and in others, but I will go quicker through those areas so as not to, to uh, repeat too much. But I, I do work with Southern Company. I work in a corporate um, technical services type role where we support uh, uh, the fleet as a whole. Our group is concerned with natural gas group, uh, the natural gas piping group, the high energy piping group, and our fossil or coal boiler group. I wanted to start by giving a, a very brief overview of who Southern Company is. We're the parent company for Georgia Power, Alabama Power, Mississippi Power, and Gulf Power. Also, wholesale group Southern Power. We have over 280 units at 70 plus plants utilizing coal, gas, oil, uh, nuclear, hydro, biomass, and solar. Uh, generating units. The majority of our plants are located in the southeast, but we do have a few assets, uh, some solar in Nevada and New Mexico, biomass in Texas, and gas in North Carolina. We're currently involved with a lot of projects uh, similar to what other utilities I'm sure are doing. We're adding bag houses, we're adding scrubbers, adding carbon injection system, all for environmental compliance. And I wanted to highlight a couple of, of higher profile projects that we're currently involved with. One is a addition of nuclear units at an existing facility, and the other is a, a gasification project located in, in Mississippi. The first is the, and near Waynesboro, Georgia, we're adding two additional nuclear units to where we already have units one and two. Investing $14 billion for these two units and plan to have these two units on site in 2017 and 2018. In Mississippi, we're planning on using coal in a way that it's, we've never used it before. We've located Plant Ratcliffe near the mouth of a lignite mine and we're going to convey coal over directly to plant Ratcliffe, and we're going to expose it to high temperature, high pressures, and we're going to synthesize or produce a synthesis gas, which we will clean and then uh, produce, uh, remove 65% of the CO2 and then produce electricity in a gas turbine. This approximate $5 billion investment is uh, planning to come online in the first of 2015. The main reason I'm here to discuss or, or to talk with you is to discuss our experience to date with converting coal units to fire natural gas. I'm going to go over at a high level why we're doing it, where we're doing it, what we're doing, and how we're doing it, and when we're going to go about converting coal gases, coal plants to fire natural gas. Starting with the why, it's been talked about the regulatory drivers and the economics. All the way from this morning, Susan brought up the mercury neck air toxic standards, which sets numerical emission limits for mercury, PM, and HCL. We're investing a lot of capital today across our coal fleet to become in compliance with this rule. This rule, however, does not apply to natural gas plants. And a natural gas unit, as defined by the Clean Air Act, Section 112A8, is an electric generating unit that combusts natural gas exclusively, obviously, or in combination with another fossil fuel. As long as 90% of the average annual heat input over a three-year period is from natural gas, 
with an allotment for one year as low as 85%, but an overall average of 90% over a three-year period, if it comes from natural gas, you can define your boiler as a natural gas unit and not be subject to this regulation. So that's one of the drivers. Uh, the other drivers are economics. This charter and other forms are, have been, has been shown before, showing the relatively low and stable gas prices over the past few years. Southern Company began exploring converting natural gas, our coal units, to natural gas in about third quarter of 2010, October 2010, with prices relatively low and mats in the air, we began looking uh, at, at converting. And, and where will the price of natural gas be in 5, 10, 20 years? It's been a topic discussed already this morning, and, and with, I don't think we've nailed down exactly what that's going to do yet um, with, with many other investment entities, uh, consulting firms, there's been no shortage of forecast, but it just, it really underscores the difficulty in trying to pinpoint a reliable number in a market that's operating outside of its historical fundamentals foundation. But that being said, natural gas does look big. Uh, it does like it's going to be a part of our mix in the coming years. It's already changed the way we do business, or the way we produce electricity. Oh, for over 100 years, we've been a predominantly coal-fired generating company. This was up until 2011. In 2012 and in continuing in 2013, most of our generation came from natural gas, 43% from natural gas and 36% from coal. So we've seen immediate changes based on just the economics. So October of 2010, I get a call asking, can we fire natural gas in a, in a particular boiler and get full load? And if so, how much will it cost? And after saying I don't know to both questions, I began the process of, of determining whether we can do that or not. And uh, first piece of research I came upon was a white paper produced by B&W titled Natural Gas Conversions of Existing Cold Fire Boilers. In this white paper, B&W explored three potential coal plants that uh, wanted to look at converting. And in these the white papers, conclusions were that of the three units, one of them could convert with, with no reduction in performance. The other two would see a slight derate in performance. And it also it suggested that a cost would be between $50 to $75 a kW to make that conversion. This is, again, similar to Joe's numbers, Bowler Island only does not include supply or upgrades to the supply of gas to the boiler. Paper also suggested due to the unique characteristics of boilers, a, a specific study would need to be undertaken to fully know performance options and, and cost with a boiler. So we, we began to, to look at a few targeted plants for potentially converting from coal to gas. We contracted with B&W and Babcock Power at, it's actually uh, five plants. These two are, are the same plant, just two different, um, a B&W and a Riley Power boiler. But we looked at five plants, 13 units for potential conversion from coal to gas. And we had studies performed, feasibility studies, engineering studies, uh, thermal models developed to look at uh, what it would what, what, what performance would look like and what the cost would be. We had these, I'll back up a bit. Well, the costs we found were 40 to $50 a kW to look at our actual units. That was a specific look. And I'll point out that uh, B&W looked at their own units. Babcock Power looked at their Riley unit. And we also had them look at some Alstom units, some T-fired units. And the reason for this, this was October 10. We needed the results. We had asked for the results by the end of 2010. They needed to be completed, and uh, Babcock Power could accommodate that schedule at that particular time. The OEM, uh, Austin, could not accommodate the schedule. That's why uh, we had Babcock Power do studies on units that were not theirs. So $40 to $50 is what we could expect. So we began, took those numbers, we looked at uh, 
upcoming regulations, not just MATS, but 316B uh, water regulations coming, um, ash reg <clears throat> regulations coming, CCR, and now CO2, which is, is we, we have a little clearer picture of what that will be, but uh, we, we put this into a model, compare it to putting the AQCS on the back end or adding a new combined cycle units, and we decided, we made a decision to move forward at at, at three plants, again, these two are the, are the same plant, two different units, but we decided to move forward with three plants, eight units. We decided not to move for, go forward with one plant that had two units, and we have, we originally decided to go forward with this particular plant, three units, but uh, have since re are reevaluating that business case. So this was, Joe did a really good job of, of, of talking about this. I wanted to give a little bit of an overview on the differences between natural gas combustion and coal combustion. I will go through this rather quickly. Joe talked about uh, reducing our station service demand by getting rid of feeders, pulverizers, PA fans. Typically we'll operate with a lower excess air requirement with gas, lower O2 set points, conceivably of the economizer exit. A, low, a lower overall gas flow, reducing our fan uh, demand. Greater flame stability, uh, burner reliability, smoother transitions from load, lower turn down are all benefits. Uh, but anytime you fire a fuel that the boiler was not originally designed for, there will be compromises, and there are compromises with firing natural gas. The, just a high level, natural gas is a more convective mode of heat transfer as opposed to coal, which releases a lot of heat in the furnace, radiant type heat transfer. Uh, do, this is because of the greater moisture in the flue gas, but the, 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 the uh, natural gas gives off a lot of heat further down the boiler. And so our furnace exit gas temperature goes up, which causes us to spray more, more temperation required in the back pass potential for thermos, thermal stressing our pressure parts, higher stack temperatures, and the biggest compromise is the lower boiler efficiency. Talked about 3%. Some of our studies suggested as high as 7% reduction in boiler efficiency. And the possible D rate. None of our units, all of our units, uh, when feasibility engineering studies were shown, had D rates. One unit was going to be close. We were going to have to probably fire with greater excess air than we wanted to, but that was the unit we ended up not going forward with. So we don't anticipate a D rate with our conversion as is. No slagging, no PM, no fouling, more moisture. Do I have to be concerned with my duct work downstream, precipitator housing? We often talk about, and this hasn't been mentioned today, but uh, we often talk about natural gas being the cleaner alternative to coal, and that's the case when we talk SOX, NOx, and CO2, clearly. But our models have shown that CO, carbon monoxide, may slightly increase when we change from, from coal to natural gas. It's not intuitive to me, but we've seen this now from multiple studies, from multiple vendors, and it's a very small increase, but it did play a factor in our permitting process, making sure we explain uh, what, what all we think will happen. So what are we doing at our plants? Again, talked about really well. We definitely are changing our fuel supply equipment and our burners. That's the minimum. You have to change your delivery and the, the method of getting, the, the, have to have some means of getting gas into the boiler. So we're going from conveying crushed coal to um, uh, using gas piping to, to draw, to, to, to deliver the fuel to the, to the boiler, and we're going to modify our burners in some fashion. It looks like we had some of these slides are uh, different types of PowerPoint program. We've had some overlaps. I apologize for that. But the bottom items may or may not be required. They just require some evaluation. Do I have enough margin in my temperators? Now with, with greater furnace exit gas temperature, I'm going to find myself spraying more. Do I have enough there? Some cases we did, some cases we didn't. Pressure part replacement, I'm with greater temperatures there. Do I need to do major surgery when we start talking about 
uh, replacing pressure parts, and it, especially if they're not near the end of their life. The FD fans, I mentioned, and Joe did a good job of talking about this, but I mentioned that the total gas flow goes down, but if we get rid of our PA fans, you know, roughly 20% of our combustion air comes from our PA fans, and so we're getting rid of that. If I don't reduce my total gas flow by 20%, now I'm, produce, I'm, I'm, I'm supplying more fan, more air from my FD fan through the same duct. So I've got a greater head, I've got a greater flow, got to make sure I've got enough capacity there. And flame scanners may have to change from an IR to a UV type scanner or make physical modifications that can see a, a gas flame uh, that may not, maybe it's set to see a coal flame, maybe the gas flame is in a different location. So these are the things that, that have to be identified or, or evaluated for potential modifications or changes. And the how, in some of our cases, we're going to retain the ability to fire coal. Some we are not. Where we are, we're, we're not doing the ring approach, as uh, Joe talked about. We're actually taking our existing coal burners and sticking a, a gas lance, gas gun, right down the center of the coal nozzle, this, this sort of peach uh, nozzle there, right down the center. And uh, the studies have shown we can get full load with gas or with coal, even, even putting that gas gun down the center of the coal nozzle. It does not restrict it. Uh, so that's what, uh, that's what we will be doing at our wall-fired units. And this is a, a picture of one at one of our sites where we've got the, the gas guns, gas nozzles that will go down the burner nozzles, and this wall sit inside of this burner housing. So the now I want to talk about the four plants we're moving forward with and just give you a high-level overview on what we're going to be doing at these plants. Plant Gaston located just south of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, it's located in a rural area like a lot of our plants are and it doesn't have gas on site today. So we are adding a new gas lateral and we're tying into a point just under 32 miles away with this new gas lateral. It will supply four units for 250 megawatt BNW units, and, and, and we, will, we will be converting there. We're going to have 100% gas capability on these four 250 megawatt units, and we're going to maintain coal backup. This coal backup will not be MATS compliant, so therefore I can only get 10% or less heat input on an annual basis from coal, but uh, we do have that ability to do so. We competitively bid the material, and, and that material was awarded to B&W, and that job is currently the, 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 the line. We're heavy constructing the line right now, hope to be completed by the end of the year. The material is also under construction. We have a fifth unit on this site, an 880-megawatt Alstom unit, eight-corner T-fired unit that currently or has today has oil igniters and oil warm-up guns. We're going to go ahead, we've done the economics, and we're going to go ahead and convert that unit to uh, use gas instead of oil for igniters and, and, and start our warm-up guns. Alstom's helping us with that. And we're going to go ahead and add an, an auxiliary or package boiler to the site to help with su a startup support. Competitively bid that, and we're getting that from Rentec. Plant Green County, located kind of southwest Alabama near Demopolis, Alabama, has a B&W and a Riley Power unit, both about 250, 270 megawatts. This particular facility, we're going to switch from Alabama bituminous coal to a sub-bituminous PRB coal, and we're going to go ahead and install all the MATS compliant equipment. We're going to inject carbon, and we're going to control the sulfuric acid mist ahead of that carbon so that we can uh, um, reduce the SO3 that wants to fight with or wants to compete with, with mercury for that carbon. So we're putting in a full complement of, of lime injection, carbon injection ahead of a precipitator, doing a hot to cold precipitator conversion as well so that we can inject uh, downstream of the air heater, upstream of the precipitator. We are also, oh, so we're going to maybe MATS compliant. We're also adding 100% natural gas capability. Right now we have gas igniters. We have nine CTs on site at this particular plant. So 
supply to the plant is good. We have adequate supply for the nine CTs plus the two uh, boiler, coal boilers, and, and without upgrading. There is some on-site upgrades required, getting from one place to another, a little bit larger line, but uh, minor upgrades required for infrastructure, for plumbing to the gas over to the boiler. So we're going to have the ability to fire 100 percent PRB or 100 percent gas or some blend therein. We are currently working with B&W and Riley Power to sort of identify the sweet spot from emissions standpoint, from a uh, operation standpoint, and from a uh, carbon injection. Where is that point where I can reduce my carbon injection to a good point, or is there a point? Is it 80 percent PRB, 20 percent gas, 60, 40, 40, 60? We're currently looking at that uh, potential blend. So that's, we'll operate somewhere in that PRB, gas, or a blend. Plant Yates is located southwest of Atlanta, Georgia. This is an uh, Austin unit. We have seven coal units here, five kind of down the hill in the, in the background there, uh, and two here. We're, taking, we're going to retire these five coal units, and we're going to convert these two coal units to 100 percent natural gas and no coal. And we have competitively bid that burner, th those, that job, the material change outs necessary, and the Babcock Power was, the, was awarded that particular project. This is a drawing provided by Babcock Power showing what the wind box will look like going forward. We're actually reducing, this is a, a corner fired unit, so today there are five coal burners per corner, a total of 20 burners. We will have four uh, gas burners per corner when we're done, when we make the conversion. We'll, the middle compartment will not have um, gas, a gas burner associated with it. So we're going from 20 burners to 16 burners. Lastly is Plant Berry, which is located South Alabama, just above Mobile. This is the plant that originally was, was moving, moving ahead, but we're currently reevaluating uh, the, the economics, the business case there. We've got two, uh, three Alstom T-fired units, 225 megawatt units, and one split furnace, 225 megawatt unit. Assuming we go forward, we will do a 100% coal to gas conversion with no coal backup. We have an RFQ package my department does. We, we're ready to go. It's sitting on the shelf. We almost sent it out before, and, and we were asked to reestimate, rebid, and we are currently uh, just waiting on word to move forward with that project. <laughs> that one really got jumbled. I apologize, but wanted to talk about the wind. Uh, wow. Uh, basically, the schedule is driven by mats because we are converting to uh, not comply, that's the choice we're making, to not comply with mats at these units that we're going 100 percent gas with no coal. So the match driver is April 16th of 2015. You must be compliant with mats if you're a coal unit or unless you are granted a one-year state extension, uh, which we've had three plants. The three plants in Alabama have all been granted a one-year state extension. So they're looking at April 16th of 2016 to be completed with this work. And the plant in Georgia, Plant Yates, did not ask for, did not receive a uh, one-year state extension. So they will actually be uh, completing their conversion by April 16th of 2015. And uh, that's not very far. This is the 2015, or should be. Um, and this is where we are. So very, very uh, not that far away. And interestingly enough, Yates was the last one last plan in our, our group to decide to make the decision to go forward. Uh, well, Barry, I guess, now moves to the last and we're still evaluating. But they were last one to commit, and they will be the first one online. So they're going from last to first, and doing that project's going at a, at, a, at a very quick pace right now, as you could imagine. So just last slide, uh, maybe a heed or a warning. We've talked about the pressures that coal see in in the, in, the, in the spring of 2010. The Sierra Club started an initiative 
called Beyond Coal, where they went to universities, began promoting alternative energy, and were very successful at, at stopping a lot of new development and even closing retiring some plants. Spring of, or March of 2012, a new initiative the Sierra Club started was called Beyond Natural Gas. And this, this, this movement promises to challenge all things natural gas, from, from drilling to piping to power production, liquefied natural gas um, exporting. And this is an about face from their movement, the Beyond Coal movement, which championed natural gas as an alternative to coal. So we've, we've hit on the pressures, and I think it's been hinted at. This may be just the start of CO2, but we've hinted at that. But there will be additional pressures coming with natural gas as well uh, in the near future. So thank you. Any questions? Michael, can you share what kind of capacity factor you expect with these converted units? I was heavily involved with these projects from the conceptual side. Uh, that is, deciding whether to go forward. And we decided to go forward on, on three plants and, and maybe the fourth. And, and so my involvement has, we're in the detail stage now, and I'm not as involved. Uh, I can tell you that we were expecting it to be reduced. Uh, I don't, I could, I'm not hiding numbers because I don't know the numbers, but uh, when I was involved, we were expecting the capacity factor to go down. Uh, Michael, I just have a quick question. Do you know, was, did you have a standard NOx number to hit for these gas conversions, or was it different per unit? It was, um, I, think, I think the permitting, we just needed, we did not have a standard number. It was, uh, we were showing it going down, and obviously, and uh, that was good enough for our permitting purposes. Okay. Yes, my name is Ben Green. I'm with American Electric Power. Uh, just to pick it off and gentlemen in the back about the capacity factor, what about the life cycle of these facilities? in terms of the design. Life cycle, how, how long, how, how long do you expect those units to operate? I don't know. I think our evaluation, uh, I don't know the answer. I don't know. The evaluation, I think, was through, um, I don't want to say a number that's not okay, right. Okay, I understand. I don't know. I don't okay. Know. Uh, two more quick questions. Okay. Uh, pressure part replacements. Um, have you all identified pressure parts that need to be changed within the, within the three facilities, or is that maybe um, maybe what's holding you all up with that fourth facility in terms of the evaluation of the pressure parts? Yeah, good question. I took a slide out that showed that. I, I didn't know if it would be uh, uh, applicable to the group, but uh, yeah, we we have identified. Uh, our, our, our studies identified areas where we will have greater thermal stresses. Uh, recommendation uh, was made that uh, our, our the suppliers, the, the studies said you're not going to have an immediate failure, mm -hmm. uh, so you're just going to shorten the life of the material. So if you're looking for 10 more years, you can expect something less. Again, that's a function of capacity factor, mm -hmm. too. So if we continue to operate at the same capacity factor, we would reduce the life of our pressure parts. Mm -hmm. We have opted not to change any pressure parts. We are going to, we have identified, and we're going to mm -hmm. keep an eye on those areas that we know we're going to have thermal stre or greater stresses. So we'll get in there every time we're down, and we'll inspect those areas more frequently than we had in the past. But we're not, uh, none of our uh, plant, and that's not what's holding the fourth unit up. It, uh, other other uh, reasons. It was, but we're, uh, none of our cases are we doing any pressure part replacement. Right, okay, just one final question at your plant, Gaston. Uh, you, you mentioned in your slide here that BMW was awarded the burner material. Did you spec out your requirements for a burner, or did they offer you essentially their latest and greatest design? I know BMW typically use it, um, I believe, an um, XCL type burner for the gas um, conversions. 
Can you well, speak we, a little bit about that? Uh, sure. We, we, uh, we looked at that job in two different ways, but we, we wanted to retain coal and we wanted to add gas. So that we wrote a spec that kind of limits them there. We looked at both replacing a brand, getting a brand new burner with a, with a coal added to it, and we looked at reusing the existing coal burners with just adding a new gas uh, gun down the middle. Uh, economically, we went the latter, but we had set a spec for them to follow, and uh, I don't remember what burner type, with the new burner type, I don't remember what, because uh, I wasn't involved with the details, but uh, I don't know if they, pr which, which new coal burner they pr pr uh, proposed along with the gas, but we went with the existing burner that's there today. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, and I don't know if this is something that you dealt with, because you might not have gotten into this part of the planning, but to what extent did you look at just starting from scratch with a new combined cycle unit in these, given the kinds of D-rates and the kinds of capacity factor uh, numbers that you're implying yeah, here? Yeah. <clears throat> I did not get involved with that. I, I got involved with getting the numbers together and feeding the group that did that, and that's what they did. They take a model that uh, I, I, the results of their modeling, it's a, an involved. I've asked to be, them to explain it to me, and I, it goes over my head every time they explain it to me, but what they produce is a three by three matrix that looks at um, upcoming regulations, uh, water, because we've just talked about mats or the, the 316B rule, the CCR rule coming will be a, a greater impact to us, I think, than is the mats rule. Uh, so, and the CO2 thrown in there as well. So a lot more, uh, fun coming, if you will. So we look at all that that's coming and compare, you know, adding that to the plant or going new combined cycle. And so they, what they do is they look at all three options and set them up and they went forward with the, the gas option at these particular plants. But that is kind of the, the base case is a combined cycle, a new combined cycle unit. And does Southern have some where they, where you ended up going the new to take down the coal not plant? Not of these, not of these. Uh, the one that we did not go forward with is, is going to be retired. So we did not have, the ones we targeted for, for gas to, uh, for coal to gas, we did not go with a get combined cycle option. Now we're adding combined cycles, uh, but uh, none of these were, uh, were, were. Thank you. Uh, Any more questions? 